Coming up on Dare to Love Muslims. Life for Muslim women can be difficult no matter where they live, but for those living in extreme Islamic countries, it can be inhumane. Samia's guest today spent several years living with her family in Yemen, where the extreme poverty of that country only added to the difficulties of women's lives. Hear how her experiences in Yemen prompted her to write an intriguing novel about extremism and how it works its way into the West. Welcome, dear viewers. I'm Samia Johnson, exploring with you new areas in the Muslim world where usually media falls short in disclosing the full picture. Today we will take a closer look at the indigenous Muslims who live in the villages and towns of a very extreme Muslim country, Yemen. My guest who lived for many years with her family in Yemen will share real stories from that land that has seen brutal killings of missionaries and Muslim locals who oppose the insurgent Muslim militias and gangs. Let's start by taking a one minute tour into Yemen. Yemen sits on the southwestern tip of the Arabian Peninsula, just below Saudi Arabia next to Oman. It's about twice the size of Colorado with miles and miles of coastline, mountain ranges, high plateaus, and sandy deserts. While other countries on the Arabian Peninsula are kingdoms or emirates, Yemen is the only republic form of government. Islam is the official state religion of Yemen and Sharia law controls its judicial system. Nearly 100% of the 24 million Yemenis are Muslims. Yemen was once a strong Christian nation, but the Muslim conquest in the seventh century nearly wiped out all Christians. These days, missionary slayings and the existence of extreme Muslim groups have forced many Christian workers to flee the country. Pressure from the Muslim community to convert to Islam keeps most Muslim converts underground. Pray for Yemenis to hear the gospel of Jesus through media outlets, radio, satellite TV, and the internet, and pray for peace to come to this battle-weary region. Amen. The Yemenis need our prayers to have a spiritual breakthrough. My guest today is Audra Shelby, author of Behind the Veils of Yemen. Audra lived in Yemen for many years with her husband and four children. She was committed to reflect Jesus courageously in a land as dry spiritually as the desert that surrounds it. Welcome, Audra. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. We are delighted to have you and to learn from you about uh, the Yemen, your life there, and the Yemenis, especially Yemeni women. Tell us a little bit about the Yemeni people. Not so much is known about them. All we know is the extreme jihadists who are suicide bombers that come from that land, but not a lot is known about them, especially Yemeni uh, women. So what is the culture about there? Is it a modern uh, culture? Is it uh, third world? How do you describe it? We, dis we describe Yemen like stepping back a hundred years into time. Yes. Um, where we lived in the Tahama region, 98% illiteracy among women. Mm. Uh, they, are, they are not educated. Um, even 80% illiteracy among men. The people live in uh, mud huts, you know, no mm -hmm. running water, no electricity in these tiny villages. The people themselves, I was overwhelmed by how friendly and welcoming mm. and re receptive they were to us as internationals, Americans. People would stop and, and welcome, welcome on the, us on the street and invite us into the, I never knew hospitality until I lived in Yemen and people would invite us into their homes and share the big meal of the day for lunch. Yes. And would use their whole week's worth of food to host us as mm, an honored to be guest generous. in their home. To be generous. Yes. I was just overwhelmed by them. And the women, the women were so, I want to say hungry for mm, love, mm. you know, that, that really I ended up, it took a while for me to, to get to know some of them and to, um, 
and but then it became a, almost a competition where everybody wanted me in their home. Yes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed uh, reading your first book. Uh, you uh, made me feel I was in Yemen, smelling the smells there, touching yes. uh, the items and looking at the people. But did you omit or did you not put any stories that you can share with us that are not in the book? Or maybe what happened later? We were in Yemen during 9-11. Um, and so that doesn't chronicle what happened after that. What was the reaction there? It was very interesting. There was some dancing in the streets and some mm -hmm. jubilation. And at the same time, we had so many friends, Yemeni friends, call us and say, I'm so sorry, please don't think that we're all like that. Yes. So mm -hmm. it was really torn. And it, it, to give you a little glimpse of what the women were like, um, we had, I got together with some women friends later after 9-11 in, in Yemen, and um, I was obviously a little upset mm -hmm. about what had happened in, in my country. And my friend said, why are you upset? Why is this bothering you so much? She said, do you have friends that were killed in the explosion? And I said, well, no, not friends. Well, do you have family that was killed in this mm. explosion? And I said, well, no. And she said, then then why is it bothering you? It shouldn't affect you. And I thought, this is a picture mm. of a village woman in the Tahama who is who can't read or write. Her whole focus is on daily survival. Yes. So a bigger picture is so far removed. Not that she wouldn't care about it. It's mm. just that she's consumed with just surviving day She's to never day. experienced the outside world. Right. Maybe she'd have never been to a city right. uh, in her own country, so she cannot uh, comprehend how you can be upset about exactly. that. Exactly. Amen. After this short break, we will talk more about uh, the women in Yemen and their lives. But now, here is how you can get Audra's two books. Behind the Veils of Yemen captures the harrowing journey that Audra Gray Shelby and her family experienced as Christian missionaries in conservative Islamic Yemen. In a culture dangerously different from her own, Audra gives us glimpses of a world most have never seen and how the grace of God touches lives in the midst of an Islamic stronghold. And now, inspired by her life experiences in Yemen, Audra Gray Shelby has just released a new fictional work, the Grip of Lions and Veils tells a riveting story of Islamic terrorism as seen through the eyes of Kellyanna Coleman, a wife and mother ripped from her family in a deadly explosion and taken captive by Assad the Lion, deep in the heart of Yemen. Don't miss this special combined offer. Order on our website, daretolove.tv, or call us now at 832-220-4040, 832-220-4040. I'm back chatting with Audra Shelby, who lived in Yemen with her family as missionaries reaching uh, Yemeni uh, women and men who are Muslims. Uh, Audra, uh, I know that uh, Yemen, 99.9% .9 of the population are Muslims. So uh, what did you do to learn a little bit about their religion? Did you study there uh, about Islam and comparisons, or uh, did you prepare yourself before going to Yemen? That's a good question. Before we went to Yemen, we spent a lot of time researching not only about Yemen itself, its mm -hmm. background, its history, and the people and the culture, but also about Islam, learning what Islam is, what Muslims believe, how they practice their faith. And then as part of our language program, it's a cultural, the barefoot program we used was a cultural learning as well that helped us understand how they incorporate their beliefs into their everyday lives, how it plays out is in their traditions. That, that is practice. wonderful. We talked a little bit about Yemeni women before the short break, but uh, tell me about uh, marriage. I hear that there are a lot of uh, uh, marriages uh, with young uh, girls, uh, 10 years old, 12 years old. Is that true or is the media making a big deal out of it? No, it is absolutely true. Mm. I, I knew personally um, at least two brides that were 13 I knew of a, a situation where someone was offered an older man, he was in his 60s, was offered a nine-year-old to be his wife from a very poor family. So it is mostly poverty, or do you think Islam plays a role in this as well? I don't think they see anything wrong with it. 
average, I would say, is around 15 mm -hmm. for a girl to be married. But as I said, I knew girls that were much younger, older than that. Um, if a girl goes to university, which is very rare, except for in the big, in the capital. Um, but yes, it's very common. They're considered marriageable when puberty hits, and in the Middle East, that's usually around nine or 10. Tell us a little bit about their lives. What are uh, their, the day, how does their day go? And uh, religiously, are they very devout and practicing? The Muslim women I knew, now these, these are in the villages outside of the, the capital, mm -hmm. but they have very hard lives. I mean, they don't have refrigerators where they put their food, so they buy in the morning, you know, they send their husbands usually because they don't usually go to the souk because they try to avoid contact with men, mm -hmm. but they get the day supply to fix their meal um, and they spend most of the morning fixing their meal, possibly doing some of their laundry by hand. And then they feed their husbands and the men in the family, and then they will eat. And then sometimes if they can, they will have a short rest. And then they get themselves cleaned up, usually late in the afternoon after about four, and then they get together with other women for tea. Mm. And this is the, the one time that they congregate with each other. They get together and escape the drudgery and hardship of life mm. and, um, and just visit and drink tea and talk. Their husbands are usually gathered with the men, chewing kot, um, and the men are together. And then at night, usually about Maghreb, they return home you know, by dark. And kat is like a tobacco uh, that they chew. Except for it's, it's slightly narcotic. Slightly yes. narcotic. Yes, yes. Yeah. it's very addictive, and it's the, the pastime of Yemen, for, at least for the men, to chew kot. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell us about uh, some incidences of how the Lord used you to reflect your faith and Jesus Christ among Yemeni women. I know you had to be very careful and choose the right timing. Uh, they knew you were Messiahia, which is a Christian. Christian right. uh, so uh, tell us some incidences or stories. Well, to begin with, Yemen, it's illegal to evangelize, proselytize in any form in Yemen because it is very restrictive and very conservative. Mm -hmm. But the women are, and the people in, generally are so, in general, are so curious about us as Christians. And I would go, I never had to sh try to create opportunities to share my faith. They were so curious about me. Mm -hmm. I would be, I remember specifically, and this is in Behind the Veils of Yemen, being in someone's home for a wedding. You know, it was all the women getting together and these girls, and I was meeting everybody and stumbling through my Arabic and <laughs> these girls were talking next to me and uh, they were whispering, whispering, and finally one leans over and says, Enti Habuba, you know, you're lovely. You're, you're no, in, in total shock. Mm -hmm. And it just really occurred to me, I was very different from what she had been told Christian women are like yes. because of the way we're depicted Christian. If they think of all Americans as Christian yes. and how they see women, mm -hmm. American women in film, to them describes what American Christians are like. So that really surprised them. And then to see that my husband really loved me mm. and talked to me, a lot of times I knew more what their husbands were doing than they did because... From your husband. From my husband, <laughs> yeah. you know, and they couldn't believe that my husband actually conversed with me, mm. not giving me orders or directions or commands, but really talked to me. As an equal. He, as an mm -hmm. equal and loved me, mm -hmm. not sensually, but really loved me intimately. And that was something they could not understand. So I remember one time in a village, these women gathered, they put out their prayer rugs, they lined up and they, you know, they did all their washing first mm -hmm. and then they prayed um, and they did their, all their prayers. Well, when they finished, I had a friend with them and I said, wait, wait, don't put your rugs up. We want to pray. And they were, you know, you pray? Yeah. I was total shock. Because and I they said, don't yes, see us praying. They don't. Yes. And, and I said, yes, we pray. Mm -hmm. And then they, well, well, do you wash? You know, I mean, they're they're like, oh, yeah, yeah. OK, well, you say you pray, but you, do you wash before you pray? And it was a wonderful opportunity to say, you know what? Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Yes. Our book teaches us that being clean on the outside isn't enough to come into the presence of God. You have to be clean on the inside. And that's what Jesus Christ came to do, to make us clean on the inside mm -hmm. so that we can stand in the presence of God and talk with him. What an opportunity. So that's, you know, that's the, the, 
opportunities were just endless. And you knelt and prayed. I did. We prayed. <laughs> my friend and I prayed. And then, of course, they, the women were like, your prayers are short because we prayed in English. We prayed out loud, yes. actually praying for the women mm -hmm. that they would, God would open their minds to understanding his truth. And afterwards, the women were like, well, your prayers are short. And I said, well, you know what? We don't recite words. We talk to God from our hearts because we pray through Jesus Christ. And they were like, Oh, you, uh, you they can, were you, surprised. Very surprised. Yes, yes. Very that surprised. story is beautiful in your book. You know, Audra, these days uh, the Lord is revealing himself in a special way to Muslim women all over the Islamic countries. And we see it firsthand in many uh, countries where we visit and we minister among refugees, whether Iraqi or Syrian refugees. And these women are taking a step of courage and confessing Jesus as Lord and Savior and are willing to to pay the price. So praise the Lord for mm -hmm. what he is doing. These women have lost everything when they fled from their countries because of ISIS and war. So I encourage you today to partner with us to empower these women who are stepping out of Islam into life with Christ. After we come back from a short break, we will hear more of Audra's stories from Yemen, and we'll talk about the two books she authored as a result of living in Yemen. But now here's your chance to partner with us so that we can help more Muslim women who have accepted the Lord and are impacting their families as well. What percentage of the world's Muslim population is Arab? Is it A, 70%, B, 45%, or C, 23%? The answer, right after this. I have three children, and I recently accepted Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I came to Lebanon from Syria with my family when war started. I started coming to church where I learned about Jesus Christ. I knelt down and asked him to forgive me of all my sins, and now I am his daughter. There are many similar stories from Syrian and Iraqi refugees who have found Jesus through the Christian Relief Ministries we partner with in Lebanon, Northern Iraq, Turkey, and Jordan. Help us support Christian evangelism to refugees forced from their homes by Islamic extremists in the Middle East. Your tax-deductible gift of $25 or more makes it possible for us to continue reaching refugees with the love of Christ. Call now, 832-220-4040 or go to daretolove.tv and click on Donate to start your partnership. I was a veiled Muslim woman. I took off the hijab because I experienced Jesus in my life. Now he lives in my heart. Learn more about our ministry on our website, daretolove.tv. You'll find a number of helpful, free resources, including online books and articles, as well as our radio and television programs. And why not check out our online store with all of the tools you need to get started reaching out to Muslims in your neighborhood. And feel free to contact us with your comments and questions. We'd love to hear from you. It's all on our website, daretolove.tv, daretolove.tv. So what percentage of the world's Muslim population is Arab? The answer is C. Only 23% of Muslims in the world are Arabs. The rest are mostly from Asia and Africa. I'm still chatting with my guest today, Audra Shelby, who lived many years in Yemen with her family. She's the author of these two great books, Behind the Veils of Yemen, and the most recent book, The Grip of Lions and Veils. And Audra, I want to start with your most recent book. It is a fiction it book. It is. It is a story. Yes. So tell me why and how were you inspired to uh, write a fiction book? Well, first of all, it's very difficult to write about the Middle East, which I'm mm -hmm. sure you're aware, because there's security risk. Yemen is closed, a closed country, and it's very difficult to write about Yemen without uh, compromising people work, um, the people themselves, I wouldn't do nothing to want to harm, you know, yes. to, to harm them. Mm -hmm. So there, but there's so much to tell and there's so much that people need to understand. Mm -hmm. And I thought what better way than to tell a story and I call it reality fiction mm -hmm. because the situations are very real. The circumstances are very real. The characters are fictional. Um, the plot is, is fictional, but there's so much truth in reality mixed in. I could 
I could have no greater freedom mm. to be able to tell and help people understand Muslim Muslim women than I could by just going it going fiction and not have to worry about security issues. And the place of the story is in Yemen, right? Yes, it is. The main the, the main portion of the story. The is in main Yemen. portion, right? So, uh, what is the message that you want to get to the reader, uh, other than telling them about that country? I, I know there are many messages, yes. and the plot is very intricate and complex complicated and uh, there are many great uh, personalities there, whether men or women. So uh, a couple of the messages you want the reader to get. Well, one would be, it's about a terrorist and an abduction by a terrorist, but you know, God doesn't look at terrorists as we tend to look at them. Mm. He sees a heart that needs to be transformed, just like there was a terrorist in the Middle East who tortured women and men and pulled them from their homes until he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And that well, was? That was Paul. Yes. Saul became Paul. I believe he can do that with any terrorist, Amen. but a lot of times it's our hearts that get in the way. Mm -hmm. We want God to get even with them rather than see him transform their lives. Yes. So I really wanted to write a story to get into the life of a terrorist and say, you know what, there's more. So that was one theme to really show, um, yes, there's evil, pure, mm -hmm flat out evil, mm -hmm. but there are other hearts that are hurting and lashing out in terrorism out of pain. Out of pain and sometimes out of fear. Exactly. Because of oppression or someone making them do it. Exactly. Yes. So that's, that's a theme. And another theme, um, probably more central, is life is not about us. Mm -hmm. It's not about our comfort. It's not about our happiness or our pursuit of happiness. It's about God, worshiping God, drawing, getting to know him into a full relationship Amen. with him, drawing other people into that relationship with him. And that's a theme is, is sacrificing, giving up something that might make you happy and comfortable but it's not what's more important. Let's go back to your first book, which yes. I read now two times. The first time, it was a couple of years ago, and I was really touched by every story. Uh, how about you tell us about maybe one story, especially Fatima or another uh, uh, young woman that had touched your heart and you still maybe pray for and uh, look forward maybe to hear good news about that she accepted Christ. Well, I continue to, to pray for Fatima. The, the story that comes most to mind are, are these young, we talked a little bit about um, brides, young mm -hmm. brides. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really touches my heart with these young girls is a lot of them are so excited to get married yes. because it's their time of life. They're a queen for a week. They're fetid. They're the center of attention. Yes, and their mm -hmm. makeup and hair and their yes. beautiful clothes. And they're so excited and they're so nervous about becoming a bride. And they have all these dreams mm -hmm. of, of what married life is going to be like them. And I see them a year later and they're their appearance, their countenance is just shattered. They're wilted. Mm -hmm. They are. I mm -hmm. mean, it's like the hope is gone. The mm -hmm. dreams are gone from their eyes. And that that hurts me. I, I just have seen so many, and one in particular just broke my heart. She was so dismal. It's like, this, if this is all there is, mm -hmm. you know, because really she's left her father's domain for her husband's yes. domain. And these are the women that I long for them to know how much God loves them and how special and valuable they are to Him. Amen. And how much He wants to, to for them to know Him mm. and to give them a life that is so full of everything that they'll never find Amen. on this earth or Amen. in a relationship with a, mm. a husband or a father or anybody else. Yeah, and I heard from you that you cannot even uh, have any contact with them because they don't uh, write or uh, read and uh, no one else can read for them, it would not be safe. Right. And there are no missionaries now in Yemen. So uh, may the Lord break through their darkness through visions and dreams and appear to them and remind them of the words that uh, they have heard from you. Uh, the Lord never leaves anyone who is seeking Him. Oh, Samia, and with your ministry, what a way to get into a country where missionaries cannot go yes. into. Yes. You know, for them to be able to 
hear the word, for for your viewers to pray mm. that Jesus reveals himself to these women in dreams and speaks to them. Amen. And then to follow it up with with your ministry and with the contacts that you have Amen. through your programs. Uh, it, the time is ripe. It is. It is. And this. you know, these days, I don't know if uh, like in the cities of Yemen, there are dishes and people are watching yes. cable. So there are many Christian Arabic satellite channels. And my husband has t two or three weekly programs in Arabic. Oh, and uh, awesome. the Lord is saving many of them. And I know that in the in the past, their shortwave radio was the only way mm -hmm. for Yemeni people to uh, listen to the word of God. And when I was doing Christian Arabic radio in the 80s, we'd receive many, many letters from Adan, from Sana'a, from Hudayda, and the young men and women accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, but you know, later we didn't hear from them, uh, maybe because they were caught and uh, maybe killed, yes. or uh, they had to uh, cover uh, their faith. But uh, the Lord is saving, and there is an underground church in Yemen, I am sure. Absolutely, and, and let me share this story, and it's in my book, but it means so much because uh, I remember praying for the people of Yemen one time, just mm -hmm. really in fervent prayer for the people that God would just flood the land with his love, with Amen. his presence. And I, I, I saw a picture of him like he was on the crest of a hill ready have, with all the resources he needed to come down into that valley Amen. and take it over. For his, but then I got the sense of him waiting mm -hmm. and I'm like, OK, Lord, you know, go, come on, come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. And he spoke to me so clearly and said, I, Audra, I am waiting mm -hmm. until my desire is the desire of my people. Mm -hmm. And they asked me, and this is the time, you know, that I want to ask every believer, follower of Christ, is it our desire Amen. that Muslims come to faith in Jesus Christ? Do we believe that they can? Do we believe God can do this? Are we asking him? Amen. Thank you, Audra, for sharing your heart with us today and uh, teaching us about the Yemeni people and uh, encouraging us to have compassion and love for them so that they too would know the gospel of Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. I encourage you to get Audra's two books. Today we have a special offer if you get both of them. We've come to the end of our time and I hope you were inspired by what you heard today. You know, we cannot continue to be on air and produce this program if people like you don't join us in partnership. We totally depend on the Lord to provide for our ministry through His people. Won't you join us today in partnership? You can start your monthly commitment on our website, daretolove.tv, or call us now at 832-220-4040. Maybe God is prompting you to give a special donation of $15,000 or more. This will cover producing and airing two programs that will reach a potential of 2 billion people worldwide. We hope you'd act today. And he who provides for all of us will reward you according to his riches in heaven. You know, Christ is coming soon. So let us be diligent and faithful. Meet me here next week. Same time. Why do Muslim women cover their heads? Do all Muslims really have to pray in Arabic, even if they don't speak Arabic? Well, the more you look into Islam, the more questions you'll likely have. Get all of your questions answered by Samia right here on Dare to Love. Just email your questions to ask at daretolove.tv. Ask at daretolove.tv. If you enjoy watching Dare to Love, please consider partnering with us. Your monthly gift of $25 or more will help us continue producing this program and reaching Muslims for Christ. Call us now at 832-220-4040. 832-220-4040 or donate online at daretolove.tv. Dare to Love Muslims is made possible by the friends and partners of Call of Love Ministries.